Second Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. We've been looking at the benefits of suffering. We're going to continue to do that tonight. Of course, it's one of the greatest challenges that we face. It's why do people suffer. Some people never become a Christian as a result of this. Some people turn back. The Bible says Jesus, talking about the different types of soil, says, but he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and for quickness, for quickly, for short, a short period, receives it with joy. Uh, yet hath he not root in himself, but, you know, lasts for a while. But when tribulation and persecution comes, uh, he's offended, and he falls away. But it's not always like that. Psalms 119, 100 and, you know, the 119th Psalm, you have 100 and, what is it, 76 verses, all talking about the law of God. Notice what verse 67 says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. In other words, the affliction that I went through actually helped me out. So does suffering help? And sometimes the answer is yes. God has a purpose behind the trials and sufferings. If I was talking with a young lady, not go, who is having a very difficult, a good, good Christian girl, uh, not so much with her husband, and children involved, and uh, she just keeps one of her prayers is that God will bring some benefit uh, from the pain. And I told her, I said, you know, sometimes people suffer uh, because other people are wicked. That's just bottom line. Some people want to do some things, they're going to do them. They're not going to let God. They don't care about what God says or man. And uh, so, you know, they're just going to do that. Sometimes there is no benefit from it, but she's praying that there will be. And uh, I think if anything, it's made her stronger. It'll make her a stronger mother. In that same psalm, notice, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn from thy statutes. So a couple of times there in the book of Psalms, we see uh, where the psalmist says, suffering is not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's exactly what we need uh, to get over the hump that we're in. Why do, people, why do you suffer? Number two reason that we want to talk about tonight is repentance. Some people do not change. Israel, you could beat those people over the head with a stick, it seemed, and they didn't learn from their mistakes. They would keep doing the same thing over and over. It didn't seem to matter what, uh, you know, what was going on. So, but some people do change. No matter how much some folks suffer, they don't change, but some do. And one of the benefits of suffering is that it can change your life. We're going to look at three examples tonight. We're going to start off in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 with a fellow by the name of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh, Manasseh had a good start now. He had a good daddy, King Hezekiah. But it all went downhill from him there, for him there. Let's notice in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, and the Dixon has the first verse, then you got to turn. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Now, that's just the way things were. And, of course, at 12 years old, he didn't do anything. He didn't reign. He was just a, a figurehead, and the people that were advising him reigned. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. I think you'll be hard-pressed to find a king that reigned that long in Jerusalem. 55 years. In other words, this man's going to be 67, which is a good life. Uh, particularly in that time. But notice he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen. He wasn't no different than the other folks whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So sometimes when you have the opportunity, you want to see what were those people like, all you simply need to do is look at Leviticus 18. They were vomited out. Of course, it was used to cause that, you know, that vomit, if you will. They're the ones that chased them out, but the land vomited them of how they acted and how they behaved. Notice it says, For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. His dad started some restoration, if you will. I didn't even know my phone was here. I need to cut that off. That'd be great. Get a telemarketer right in the middle of a Bible study, wouldn't it? Uh, that's about the only people that call me. <clears throat> he built Hezekiah that he, his, his daddy had broken down. He reared up alders for Balaam. And made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. In other words, anybody he could find, he bowed down to. Also, he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said in Jerusalem, shall my name be forever. That wasn't the way it was supposed to be. 
And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So Solomon's, you know, courts that we think about, it's full of idols now. And he just don't you think about that for a moment. Don't you know how the Jews in Jerusalem were thinking, look how progressive we are. Woo, we're on the cutting edge of world theology. Man, we've got this God from this country over here and that God from that country over there. Look at us. Aren't we just educated and high tooting and more everything? We're just, mm -mm, we got it going on. When in reality, they were as far away from God as they could possibly be. You can just almost hear people talking about how open-minded they were. Coexist. Oh, you let those prophets of Baal in here. They're going to do just fine. You can hear here today about judge anybody. You shouldn't judge any religion, even though it has a, you know, a 1,300 year history of destroying people and country. But don't judge them on that. Uh, it's ridiculous. Well, that's what's happening here. They're getting all ecumenical and they're getting all coexisting, if you will. And he caused his children to pass through the, vi through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Folks, don't get any worse than that. The valley of the sons of Hinnom, that we get the word hell from, Gehenna. Um, they would actually take, sacrifice their children, kill live kids, pass them through the arms of this bull-like thing into a fire and offer up their little bodies as a sacrifice unto God. Can you get any more depraved and wicked than that? And that's what we find with Manasseh here. He caused his children, he sacrificed human sacrifices in the valley of him. And he, he also observed times uh, and used enchantments. Corey, what does the, uh, I've got there, the American Standard says practiced augury. What does the uh, ESV say there when he said observed times? Uh, verse 6, about, I don't know, second phrase into it. Fortune telling, yep, augury, fortune telling, used enchantments. Um, you know, that is a pretty popular thing with some folks today. I don't understand it, never did. But I can tell you one time, I remember being in a car, and I asked my almost stepdad at the time, what are we doing here? And he told me that my mother was inside getting her palm read. And I thought, well, who wrote on it, you know? What the, <laughs> couldn't she read her own palm? You know what, to get oily or something? She needed to, uh, well, some people do such things. Uh, I happen to like to do crossword puzzles. And, uh, you know, every, every morning, you know, I like to go out and get the paper, and if I have time that day, do the easy crossword puzzle. Okay, I can't do the hard one, so I have to do the, the easy one. And, um, you know, but if you, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays, I can do the hard one. It's not really the hard one because I can, I can do it. But, you know, the one back there, you know what's on the left side all the way down? The answers I wished. <laughs> Sometimes when they ask you things about the horoscope, the answer is over there, but it's the horoscope. What is a horoscope? A horoscope is the most useless bunch of ink ever put on paper in the world. What is it? It is nothing. It is just made up, fictitious fantasy that somebody said, I wrote the horoscope for our high school newspaper. If you want an idea of how bad that is, you know. They asked me to do it. I said, sure, I can make up anything those folks can. You know, and I actually had people compliment me on that. I was thought, okay, you know, whatever. But uh, there's people that believe that the way that the planets line up and wherever <laughs> the celestial bodies influence you. Now, listen, there are some truths to that. Ask anybody who's in law enforcement or medical care what happens on a full moon, and they'll tell you things get worse, you know. People go into labor. It also controls the tide. So I'm not saying that the moon doesn't have some influence on us uh, and, and so forth. But as far as being able to tell the future through the stars, folks, that, that's what that's talking about. So uh, used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with uh, familiar spirits and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. You know, uh, I don't have a problem with folks uh, fantasizing about uh, uh, wizards and Merlin and King David and pulling the sword from the sorcerer's stone. As long as everybody involved realizes that's fantasy, that's made up, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not true. But sometimes people get so caught up in that 
that they think that it's it's for real and that you know uh, there was a king a little boy that went out and actually pulled a sword out of a rock and Merlin was his buddy and they went on to change the world but uh, it's it's just all fantasy people need to remember that well can it get any worse we uh, not having not here in second chronicles but in second kings now <clears throat> First and second kings give you what happens to both kingdoms, the northern and the southern. The chronicles just, just keep up with the Judean kings, okay, of which Manasseh is. Manasseh is in the bloodline of Jesus. He's in the, the tribes of Judah. He's in that, uh, you know, you hear the Ming dynasty and all that. He's in the Judean dynasty of which the Christ is going to come from. He is a, he's a king in the south, the, Jew, the king, kingdom of Judah. But notice what 2 Kings records about Manasseh. It says, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. Not only his children, but people that didn't deserve to die. Innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Now, obviously, that's not talking about people walking around in blood. But it's, it's a metaphor, uh, hyperbole, if you will, to explain that it's bad. That it was so bad he'd filled Jerusalem with blood. Besides his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin and doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Not only did he sin and seem to be pretty good at it and enjoy it, but he encouraged people to sin. So what, what about that? Well, let's keep reading. And he set up a car of image, the idol, and the house of God, of which, uh, you know, God had said to David and Solomon, this was going to be his house. And so let's skip down to, uh, let's skip down to verse 11. It says, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. You see, God will take so much. But here he's kind of going to put his foot down. Which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him in, with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Now, you may have an alternate reading there, but let's spend a little bit of time with this idea of being caught in the thorns. Well, you look at this king, you think, could he change? Well, he's going to. You had this Assyrian Empire that's going to come down. They're going to be the people that have the most influence. And so they come down. One of their kings, the new king, wants to reestablish some property lines that he had before. So he comes and he attacks. And these are illustrations of the Assyrians skinning their captives. I mean, you're, the idea of skinning a man alive, uh, that's what they would do. Decapitate them. Uh, they didn't have a problem with that. As a matter of fact, it made their... Uh, what would you call that? Uh, their creds go up, I suppose. People were afraid of them. Uh, notice in Second Corinthians, uh, Second Chronicles thirty-three, eleven, it says, "Among the thorns." Notice what the commentators say about this particular phrase. Well, first of all, an illustration here of an Assyrian king. Notice the things that are in their nose, their hooks, and they would use those to tie people together. Uh, you know, you can. Uh, you might not think that, that would be very painful. You know, you see people getting piercings. But one time I left, uh, my, my stepdad had told me, don't leave that shrimp on that hook. We had a little creek ran behind our house there in East Smyrna. It was one of them black sulfur creeks, you know. You never knew what you was going to bring out of the water. I used to love it because it was always, you, you could catch eels and crabs. and It was always very interesting. Well, I had been fishing and I got done and I thought, hey, you know, I ain't worried about taking that shrimp off that hook. Surely to goodness that cat's got enough sense, you know, not to, well, no. You, know, you can imagine, I caught a catfish, but it wasn't a catfish. It was a real cat. And so my stepdad, he was able to get the hook out. Of course, I was in big trouble. And so my punishment was my mother put a clothespin on my nose. And I was like, that ain't no big deal. I can handle that. You know, the first minute, it wasn't bad at all. About minute five, I was starting to feel it. And I'm going to tell you about 10 minutes into that, man, I was crying. My ears, were, uh, ears, my ears weren't watering. My eyes were watering. It was, it was pretty bad shape. She showed mercy and, and stopped that. But you put a hook through somebody's nose and take them captive, uh, they're going to go where you went. And so this is not unheard of. Uh, now, some of the newer translations put in there another version of the put on chains. Uh, but I think that's what's listed there with fetters. But here they use in gouging out eyes. I mean, they would do all kinds of horrific things. And so the next town they attacked was far likely, more likely to just give up. Notice from an unused root, apparently meaning to pierce, by analogy, a ring for the nose. 
and that's from Strong's uh, Hebrew Concordance. Uh, with rings is what Barnes says, and uh, Powell and DeLeash said they took him with hooks. The word denotes the hook or ring which was drawn through the gills of a large fish when taken. You know, it's kind of like you put a fish on a on a, the thing you keep them on. I can't even think the name of it anymore, stringer. Um, that's the idea, and I think that's, you know, perfectly consistent with what was going on in that time and in that history. So some of the newer translations, they just leave that out and go on with chains, but I think there's some, there's some merit to that. Well, let's continue to read on as we go here. This guy is as wicked as he gets, but this king comes, takes him captive, bounds him with fetters, carries him to Babylon, and when he was in affliction, besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and he heard his prayers and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Notice the, trans the, trans uh, the, the transformation here. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was his God, and after he had built a wall without the city of David on the west side, so he's going to back, he goes and reinforces the, uh, you know, the, the walls and the cities, and note, you know, rebuilding the Jerusalem, verse 15, took away the strange gods and the idols out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord. In other words, he went into where he had put up all those different idols on the temple mount, and he knocks them all down. He destroys them all. And he repaired the, el uh, the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Of course, nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. He was unable to close those down. It goes on to say the rest of his acts are recorded in the, <clears throat> in the words of the seers. Uh, he also his recording of his prayer, also how God was entreated of him and all of his sins and the sayings of the seers. And so Manasseh slept with his father. So you ask Manasseh, can suffering help you? Well, brethren, I, I don't think that you can get much more wicked. I said, do you? I mean, a man that will kill his own children and offer them up to a false god? That's about as low. That's about a low point for me. And yet God gets Manasseh. Manasseh repents and changes his entire life around. And God blesses Jerusalem as a result of it. So sometimes, uh, you know, we might not want to suffer, but sometimes suffering is the main thing that we need. Let's turn next to Luke uh, chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, a very familiar story with every one of us. You got what we would call the prodigal son. And remember the word prodigal simply means, well, notice beginning in verse 11, you know the story. A certain man had two sons. The younger said to his father, give me your, my goods. You know what I'm going to inherit. So the father does that very thing. Gives him his living. He's not going to stop his son from exercising his free will. There's the point. Just like God today does not look over our shoulders. He's given us all these things. How are we going to handle what he's given? And not many days after the son, he leaves. It's all his substance and no dis Spent all night, uh, excuse me, spent all, spent all of his inheritance. There arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And so then what happens? Uh, he went and joined himself to a city in his foreign and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now remember, he's a Jewish boy. And here he is doing the worst thing that he could do. And notice that what he's feeding them. He's feeding them what's believed to be these carob pods. And I'd imagine they'd be dried out. And notice he's feeding those to the swine. But he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave to him. In other words, he'd just love to have some of what the pigs are eating. And you can see, it doesn't look like it's very gourmet stuff. It's not the best, but I tell you what, it could probably keep you alive. And he's so hungry, he would love to have that, but no man gave unto him. Of course, he comes to himself. What happened? He's hit rock bottom. He's suffering. He's not up to date. Uh, you know, all those great travesties of today. He ain't got enough to eat, and it's weighing on him. He's sitting here feeding these pigs with things, and he says, you know, uh, I could, I, <laughs> I, not even as his son, I could just go to work for my daddy, and things would be so much better. He, all the servants were well-fed. Uh, 
They had something to eat, so he makes up his mind, I'm going to go back, and he does that very thing. He goes to his father, and he says, I am no longer worried to be called thy son. But notice, he's practicing this, and what happens, verse 20, when he's a great way off, his father sees him, runs to him, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son, you know, starts his little spiel there of what he's been practicing to say, hoping to get into the good grace of his father is enough to at least be in a position to get something to eat. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on, his, put it on him and the ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and kill the fatted calf and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and was alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Wish the story stopped there, but it doesn't. But for our purposes tonight, it does. Here you have a fella. He had nowhere else to go. He was hit. He had hit rock bottom. I remember an aged preacher one time saying, I heard him say it more than once. I just wish I could remember which one it was. But he says, there's many prayers. There's many families. There's many people out there, parents, praying that their children will find themselves in this wine's trough. That they'll find themselves in this situation. Because right now, they got everything they need. They're not even thinking about God. They could care less. But what do they need more than anything? Their soul salvation. But they're not interested in that. So parents pray, may my son or daughter find themselves in a situation where it brings them to the understanding of what's really important and come home to the Father. Well, last but not least, we want to talk about the penitent thief. We ain't going to spend a, a whole lot of time with this. But let's turn over to Luke chapter 23. There is so much in the story of, uh, of the penitent thief. You know, sometimes I hesitate to use, use the word story. But uh, just because something's a story doesn't mean that it isn't true. Do you know where the word story comes from? Anybody? We'll just add a couple of letters on the front of it and you got it. Where the story come from? What was history? That's exactly right. So uh, it comes from the word history. Made up fable, as Peter said. We're not following cunningly devised fables, as he says. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We're reading an account of what took place, of course, when Jesus was on the cross. And so he's already been crucified. And let's begin. Luke 23, I got my sticker in the wrong place. Actually, I didn't turn to it. Luke 23, verse 39. <clears throat> then one of the malefactors, we'd call them the thieves, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Now, Christ, remember, we put some significance on that this morning. <clears throat> that is the Messiah, the chosen one. If you're able to do all these things, then save us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? You're dying. Why in the world would you make fun of this man who's innocent? It's interesting, too, because both of these thieves have been giving Jesus a hard time initially. But I guess a little time on that cross started weighing pretty heavy on this old boy. So he's, he's suffering pretty good. I can't even imagine what it would be like to go through what people went through when they were being put to death slowly by suffocation, being hung on a cross. Well, this one has changed his mind. He was all about giving Jesus a hard time before, but not now. He asked the other one that's giving him a hard time. And, you know, you can imagine that guy. He's like, well, what's changed with him? He said, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. <clears throat> One of the things I wanted to point out, I wanted to point out this morning, but I forgot it. That happens. It says, in one of the male factors, verse 39, which were hanged, railed on him. This morning when I talked about the, in the Matthew's account of 22 there, Matthew 22, how that the law and the prophets hinged or hanged on that, uh, you know, to love one another. Commandments hang all that's the same word. As a matter of fact, uh, four times that the word hanged, translated from the same word, uh, translated hang, four of those times it's talking about hanging somebody from a tree. It's talking about crucifixion, not hanging just somebody from a tree, but crucifixion. So that's another reason I like that the King James stayed with the word hanged there, 
because of what did Jesus say? He said, unless I be what? Unless I be risen up, unless I be raised. He's hanging. He's suspended from heaven and earth. You know, look at the picture there. God of heaven reconciling man back to himself. In order to do that, he is suspended between heaven and earth. That's that word hanged. And so I appreciate the, the King James Version staying with the word hanged there in Matthew uh, 22. Well, he said, Jesus said, uh, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So he pleads his case. He pleads, the Lord, have mercy on me. Here he'd been with this other fellow just giving Jesus down the road. They're dying declarations, if you will. You know, ha ha. But now that the pain set in, you can imagine it's getting worse. It'll only continue to get worse till they can do nothing about it. They will not be able to raise themselves up to breathe, nor will they be able to push themselves up with their legs. They will sin. And because tomorrow is the holy day, they're not even going to get a chance to suffocate like everybody gets crucified and suffocates, right? What's going to happen in just a few minutes, maybe an hour or so, he's going to have his legs broken. Why is that? Or he won't be able to push himself up. So the thief, in all the suffering that he's going through, he's come to himself. He's thought about what's happening, what's taking place, and he's saying, you know what? Uh, he doesn't deserve this. We do. And, of course, he asked the Lord, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know, brethren, there's so much involved in this. First of all, uh, you know, the, how much that they knew about Jesus and the things that he was teaching. But aren't you thankful for that? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I remember the first time I read a tract by the fellow by the name of uh, B.E. Howard. It was entitled, Where Are the Dead? Now, this is just one of those things where you're serendipity. You know, you're looking for one thing, but you find something else. Jesus sitting here telling this thief, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, you're forgiven. But he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So where was Jesus going in just a few moments? Paradise. But when Mary, Mag or Mary not Magdalene, but Mary comes up and grabs a hold of him, he says, you know, don't touch me. Uh, the idea there is cling to me for what? I have not yet ascended to the Father. But he's been somewhere. Where's he been? Paradise, which teaches us a, a, a lesson from Luke 16. When you sleep, like uh, the witnesses want to tell us, but you're very uh, much aware of your surroundings, and you're carried by, by angels into Abraham's bosom if you've been what you ought to be, or if you're like the rich man, you're simply in torments. The two different places in the Hadean realm, the place where the dead go, you have torments and you have Abraham's bosom, or as it's called here, paradise. Thankful for those little things that are stuck in there from time to time. That a lot of times just cursory reading, we skip right over. Jesus said, said today, you shall be with me in paradise. He's not going to the Father yet. He's going to paradise because he's fixing to be resurrected from the dead in just a few, we call it three days, but actually it was just uh, more along 30 or 40 hours, right? Well, <clears throat> are there benefits in suffering? The answer is yes, absolutely. Suffering can bring benefits. And now we've looked at a lot of different scenarios about suffering. Sometimes it's some things we've done. Sometimes we're, we're just a victim. Something happened to us. There's suffering involved. But we can have good things come as a result. Just ask King Manasseh, the prodigal, and the penitent thief. I tell you what, that story of Manasseh really sticks out to me because you think of, uh, well, how many of us have prejudged people? Well, that guy, he's so wicked, there ain't no help for him. Well, I tell you, I ain't run across too many folks any worse than this King Manasseh fellow. Uh, and the fact, and, and something that helps me with that too, is the God of heaven this is, that's who the man's sinning against more than anybody, more than me, more than society. This man is sinning against the God of heaven, and he's also influencing everybody. He's the king. Boy, if you ever thought God would just reach down from heaven and execute a man, just hit him with lightning, wouldn't this be one of the guys you'd think that would happen to? But yet, what does God do? He punishes him. He brings the king down to arrest him and incarcerate him and put him through suffering. And what's the end game? that he'd repent. You know, uh, what is it that Peter says uh, <clears throat> that God is waiting 
that he's long-suffering to all of us in Second Peter, the end of Peter's writing. Let me read it so I don't want to mess it up. <clears throat> the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should have come to repentance, that, that all should come to repentance. Folks, if God was willing to go as far as he went with King Manasseh, think about how far he'd be willing to go with people that we know need to repent, that we know that we need to teach the gospel to. It's, there's no, it's not a no hope situation. Everybody can be forgiven. Here this man executes his own kids and offers them up to a false god, and God works it so that he'll have an opportunity to repent. That, that just, I think, shines a big light on the mercy of God and helps me realize how much he loves me. So when you think about the plan of salvation, you might uh, be wondering, well, God can't forgive me. I'm going to tell you what, if he could forgive that fellow right there, unless you're some kind of serial killer, uh, mass rapist or something, I don't, I don't know how you could top that. And yet that's exactly what God did. He showed him mercy. So if you're here, you're not a Christian. Don't think you've got something in your past that you can't be forgiven for. You can. The Bible says if we hear, we can come to an understanding and believe. But we have to believe. Unless uh, we don't believe, then uh, we can't be saved. Repentance is necessary, a changing of your mind. And then, of course, confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. And baptism, whereby we make contact with the blood and are cleansed from our sin. Why don't you do that? Time's passed if you have, but you're not living your life right. Don't think you've done anything that you can't be forgiven for. Look at King Manasseh. Look at how far some of these men have gone, yet God was there waiting and encouraging them to repent. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come. As together we stand and sing. Come without the